An extraordinary breakthrough has invigorated the fight against one of the most terrifying diseases in the world. Doctors say they have cured HIV in a baby. So what does that mean for the effort to wipe out this disease and the millions of people already living with the AIDS virus? Dr. John LaPook reports. When the newborn girl was transferred to the University of Mississippi Medical Center in 2010, Dr. Hannah Gay knew her mother was HIV positive. With the infant only 30 hours old, Dr. Gay took the unusual step of using three antiviral drugs instead of the usual one or two. For the high-risk infants, it's a little bit more left to the judgment of the clinician. Um, and in this particular case, there were several factors that made this a higher risk than normal, and I chose to use the three drugs. The baby was treated for 18 months on the drug cocktail. Her viral load decreased just as we would expect it to on the medications. After 18 months, the mother stopped the baby's treatment and disappeared. Five months later, she brought the baby back to the hospital. Tests revealed no evidence of any active virus. Dr. Gay was surprised because the current strategy is to continue medication indefinitely to suppress the virus. We don't know entirely what to expect. Uh, what we're hoping for is that she remains negative throughout the rest of her life. If this success is repeated in other children, the largest implications could be in developing countries. Around the world, more than 300,000 babies contract the virus from their mothers each year. Dr. Jonathan Jacobs is an AIDS specialist. This is very encouraging, everything that's happened so far, but this uh, person has to be followed for a lot longer to really know what the uh, true effect of this early treatment was. Prevention of HIV in newborns rather than treatment is by far the best strategy. In the United States, routine HIV screening and treatment of the mother during pregnancy has dramatically lowered the number of babies born with the virus to fewer than 200 each year. Dr. John LaPook, CBS News, New York. Well, joining us this morning is Dr. Holly Phillips, CBS News medical contributor. Doctor, good morning. Thanks for uh, being here with us. Good morning. So Mary. I'd asked you before, cure, how comfortable are you with the word cure? Well, you know, based on what we know about this case, the cure is actually the only correct term to use. You know, this isn't a case where the virus was controlled down to very low levels or levels we even call undetectable. They actually could not find any fragments of the virus, which implies that the usual reservoirs where the virus hides it were, not, were not formed, and so this child was effectively cured. So this is huge. This is really huge. I have to say that the tone of the researchers is, is very controlled, <laughs> right. and I think, you know, they, they understandably don't want to scream from the top of the mountain um, that they found a cure for HIV. But in this case, it does imply that using that three-drug dr regimen right after birth made a difference for this child, and then we have to see if that can be replicated. Well, I guess that's the issue. Here you have a newborn baby, and she's about two years old now. Mm -hmm. uh, you were explaining to me that newborns have different immune uh, systems than adults, but is there a likelihood that maybe we could replicate this? Well, we would certainly hope so for the newborns. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, in developing countries, more than a thousand children are born every day to HIV positive mothers and they contract the virus from their mother. Uh, so ideally, they could be treated very early and be effectively cured. Whether or not that can uh, translate into treating adults it's far too early to say, but any news about HIV and a cure for AIDS is big news and good news. Yeah, any glimmer of hope. Absolutely. Um, so now we're going to move on to this other pretty big uh, medical story that's uh, been hitting the news. A lot of people have probably heard already the 911 call from a nurse at a uh, residential home in Bakersville, California, refusing to give an elderly woman there CPR. Let's uh, roll the 911 call if you haven't heard it yet. Is there anybody that works there that's willing to do it? We can't. Are we do just going to wait? We're going to let this lady say, die? Well, that's why we're calling 911. I'm we can't sorry. wait. She can't wait right now. She is stopping breathing. She can't wait for them to get there. Okay. Well, then, if, if, if you get anybody, any stranger that happens to walk by that's willing to help, I understand if your boss is telling you you can't do it. Yeah. But if there's any. Uh, as a human being, I don't, you know, is there anybody that's, where, yeah. that's willing to help this lady and not let her die? Um, not at this time. 
that last statement, I think, especially, is there anybody willing to not let her die? Not at this Honestly, time. Honestly, listening to that gives me chills. I know. It's really, it's really frightening, just, just on a human level, to hear someone say, absolutely, I'm unwilling to help. Oh, t indeed, and especially because uh, the woman on the phone also says that she is a nurse. She says that. Yes. So this raises all kinds of questions. A lot of people have loved ones in many of these homes. Mm -hmm. Did, did that woman on the phone or anyone else there have a legal responsibility to help that elderly patient? Likely they did not. Now mm -hmm. this was not a nursing home. Uh, it was not even a, an assisted living facility or of course a hospital. This was a residential facility and so in theory they can have an informed consent. Residents who live there can can sign away their rights even to receive CPR. You know, the, the facility can say we don't offer any sort of advanced health care, any help if you were to stop breathing, and they can make that choice, assuming it might be different if they receive Medicare or Medicaid funds. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think likely in this case, the residential facility did not have the legal responsibility to do anything ethically that can be argued. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought when I heard her say sure. that she was a nurse and you think about doctors, how there's, you know, a code of ethics and expectation and right. as a human being and as a nurse, right. you know. You know, even if the patient did not want what we call heroic measures, right. some people as they uh, get older in life, they say, you know what, I don't want heroic measures in life, I'm going to sign something called a do not resuscitate, which means advanced cardiac life support won't be done, a, a formal code blue won't be done. Even if this lady had done that, unless you're there standing holding her living will mm -hmm. and her family is gathered around, there still seems to be an ethical sense of let's do CPR until 911 arrives and then see what we can do about this. Right, and just very quickly, if you have a loved one in one of these facilities, what should you be doing right, right about now? I would be on the phone right now calling and asking what the policy is. Uh, I do think this was a very unusual case. I can't imagine places would say, absolutely do not help somebody who is in need. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always good to ask. All right, Dr. Holly Phillips, CBS News medical contributor. Thanks a lot for joining us this morning. Anytime.